Hello and welcome. You're watching NewsX. I'm Rishabh Gulati. Welcome to the second part of our dedicated telecast in association with SciConnect to look at what we must do as a global community for mental health and well-being. In the first part, and many of you would have joined us for that broadcast, both on NewsX TV as well as our online and OTT platforms, uh, you know that we focused on something that was very, very important, that we are exiting a very, very in-your-face pandemic to an invisible one. We discussed the pros and cons of what has happened. The pro, of course, being a major one, that a recognition of uh, mental health, of uh, what anxiety is, and the need to address it has risen manifold all across the globe. We've all realized that this is as serious an issue as we can imagine. So there is something to be gained from that. We have to now examine, and this is what we're going to be doing in part two of what the new normal is. And if the new normal is different, what is mental well being within that new normal going to be? Let me take the opportunity of uh, introducing uh, our panelists uh, in this uh, conversation, uh, joining us uh, on the broadcast now. Uh, we have, uh, as always, uh, Dia Ganguly Malik. Uh, she's a senior academic and uh, psychotherapist uh, trained out of the UK, and I think is currently in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. And she's, of course, the co-founder of SciConnect. She was, of course, with us uh, through the part of uh, the last telecast. She'll not only be answering questions with us, uh, but also hopefully taking some of them as well. Professor uh, Michael uh, Gradisar is a sleep therapist and director of Wink Sleep Online. That's a website that is dedicated to sleep education. Uh, fascinating. We love talking to you about that. He also does online training and professional development. Uh, uh, Professor Michael, uh, thanks very much for joining us on this telecast. Uh, and also joining us is Professor Amanda Kirby. She is CEO of uh, Do It Solutions in the UK. She's a campaigner for neurodiversity uh, and, of course, is a medic and researcher. Welcome to all of you uh, on our broadcast. And thanks so much for taking out your time to do this. Let me just uh, kick this off uh, with the uh, the uh, and a slightly personal conversation, you know, uh, we are professionals, all of us in our own right. And a realization within all of that, that we are also facing psychological challenges. So Dia, if I can take it out to you, that first of all, help us understand what is the new normal. Uh, the focus that we'll be doing with Michael during the course of the conversation on, you know, sleep being a part of, of mental well-being. Uh, can you set this up for us, Dia? And then let's take some questions with Amanda and Michael. Thank you, Risha, for having us again. And it's great to be back and talking to you. And a very good evening to all the viewers of NewsX. And uh, a warm welcome once again to our panelists who have joined us today. So coming to your question, Rishabh, uh, as you mentioned uh, rightly, the world might actually be a very different place when we get out of this. So this new normal, uh, as we are talking about, please understand that we you will be seeing a lot of changes emerging into this new normal. And these changes can be both shocking and unpleasant. So let's say, you know, when you go back to your school first, you might not see that uh, favorite snack shop of your surviving or the chai wala near your office not surviving the shutdown even when you want to you know go back to school or office after a long time and you want to hug them and welcome and you know meet them after a long time but you have to limit it to just a simple nod or a wave or a fist bump and all this to accept initially, it's going to be very difficult. Even daily activities like say, you know, like taking a tube or a train or a metro or a bus to work might feel so strange, so scary. So even let's say, you know, picking up an old habit with friends or colleagues like team lunches, fun Fridays, social gatherings, may all be tinged with the concern that is it even right to socialize in such social co uh, close contacts? So the best thing, Richard, it's to say here is accept that when you come out of this, uh, the world is actually going to look very different. So accept that we are entering a very new normal era, but take it slow. Take note of how you feel about this. Consider speaking to a professional if you still see, as you were mentioning about anxiety and worry in your introduction, if those still persist. And I would also say, you know, to do something that is called, you know, uh, radical acceptance. So embrace that. 
And you must be wondering what is that? And it's simply when you stop fighting the reality, stop responding with impulsive or destructive behavior with things that aren't going the way you've planned. Because many of our plans have been thrown completely off. And let go of the bitterness that might be keeping you trapped in this cycle of suffering. So in this new normal era, I encourage everybody to be emotionally aware, understand your emotions, feelings, respect and acknowledge a range of perspective, reflect on your experiences that you have learned during this months of lockdown, look for opportunities, financially if you're struggling, rebuild your network and relationship, and most importantly, please seek help early. And the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, everyone, remember, everyone reacts differently to change. Feelings of anxiety, irritability, out of crying, lack of appetite, even sleep. They're all signs that you might need some extra support to cope. So please meet a mental health professional for advice and resources. And just to understand in details, you know, how to cope with sleep or sleep issues or understand the connection between sleep and well-being, I would like to ask our in-house expert, Professor Michael Gradiser, who has extensive years of uh, research on sleep, to give us his views. Mike, if you could take the floor. Thanks for that introduction there. Um, and I think a lot of people have realized that when it comes to sleep, especially when you sacrifice some of your sleep, you start to notice that you don't feel the same way. And probably one of the first things you'll notice is that when you have a really bad night's sleep, especially if it's been a few nights in a row, that you'll start to have less of a positive mood. And that's the first thing that studies have shown is that when people are sleep restricted, they don't necessarily have an increase in bad mood. They have a decrease in their positive mood. And they also might be a little bit less tolerant to, to deal with personal interactions and so forth. So that's what happens in the short term, but what can happen in the long term if you start to develop sleep problems and they go on for a series of months is that you start to develop insomnia. And insomnia is actually very serious and people should hopefully be able to start to recognize within themselves insomnia, uh, but if not, uh, trying to seek support and seeing what insomnia looks like. Put simply, it can be difficulty initiating sleep at the start of the night and it also could be difficulty waking up during the night and having difficulty getting back to sleep. And another component of it is that you can actually wake up and not feel quite refreshed. Now, if something like this goes on for a period of months and possibly even uh, years, then you are at serious risk of developing depression. So for a long time, people have thought that symptoms of uh, insomnia and sleep problems were just the symptom of depression. But what we're learning now is that one of the very first symptoms of depression is insomnia. And unlike depression, which can be very difficult to treat, insomnia is actually very easy to treat. So instead of uh, having like say 12 sessions to be able to treat depression, it only takes about half that amount of time to treat insomnia. And so if you are experiencing some sort of sleep difficulties, be aware of that first is a really crucial thing uh, take note of it and po probably see what things you've changed, especially since you've gone into lockdown. Um, the good news is that we're learning a lot now because it's been almost a year that the world has gone through this lockdown and we're seeing these changes and now the data is coming out and the research studies are getting published and there's getting a nice theme there and we're starting to see what's happening to a lot of people around the world. And to sort of end this on a positive note, really, um, I should apologize because I am from Australia and we haven't been affected by COVID so much. We've gone into a lockdown for a short period of time, but in some ways Australia is almost like the future that a lot of the world will see. And you are able to adapt to the new norm and you are able to go back to a normal living. You'll probably you'll see that there's just a lot of social distancing signs around the place yeah. and probably some anticipation that there's going to be another wave coming through. But I think uh, a lot of us are now prepared for that. Uh, so at least there is hope on the horizon. Okay, uh, Professor Michael, let me just pick on that point for a second before I open uh, 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 Professor Kirby as well. Uh, have you noticed, it, is, it, is it statistical now that uh, people with uh, sleep disorders and therefore depression have, have that, that has increased over the course of the past year? Um, it's been interesting because I guess what we've noticed is that we had predictions at the outset that uh, 
uh, there could be sleep problems that do arise from this. And other people predicted that you could actually see that sleep improves. Now, the most common thing that has come through is statistically, people are going to bed later and people are waking up later. So their sleep pattern has actually shifted later. And the simple reason is that they're working from home. They're not having that travel time to work. And instead of having that travel time, they're sleeping in. And so we've seen a shift. And so in some ways, there hasn't been too much of a change in how much sleep we're getting. But interestingly, and there was a new study that came out uh, looking at this in India, that one in four people in India have noticed a change in their sleep quality. So the sleep quality that they perceive when they wake up in the morning is actually worse. And they sort of can't find necessarily reasons for that. It's not necessarily whether they're still health professionals working or they're people working from home. They can't see if it's gender. Um, there is some associations, though, with looking at some changes, for instance, in uh, their substance use. So some people uh, might be more likely to uh, have smoking or nicotine um, <laughs> and there's also alcohol to help them fall asleep. And what people don't realise is something like alcohol, as much as it helps you fall asleep, it actually also increases the chances that you'll wake up during the night. Oh, but uh, worldwide, we are seeing that there are these changes. Hopefully, we can come out of this lockdown because if we stay this way, uh, we actually might see sleep patterns get worse. And instead of being delayed, they actually start to delay and go around the clock, okay. which is you know, very... I'll, I'll come and pick your brain on, on what a healthy sleep pattern is. I don't think uh, most, most often we don't apply our mind to it, that there is a healthy sleep pattern uh, uh, other than what our parents tell us. Uh, what uh, And uh, Rich... Early to bed, early to rise. Yeah, the other <laughs> Yeah. Just on that, Richard, you know, if anybody in India now interested to know about the sleep researches and how the sleep pattern is important for our well-being, Professor uh, Michael Gradis has been very generous to offer his resources and learning through a course. So but like he was mentioning, you know, it's much easier to treat insomnia than depression. We are launching a course for our budding professionals, our students or our mental health professionals in India to learn about how you can tackle insomnia yeah, through the contemporary and techniques. Of this, uh, the, the, I mean, this is yes. available on your website then? This is or, absolutely or available. To... Yes, it's available on our website, on all our social media handles. Uh, so please uh, go on to our website, which is www.psychonnect.org, and you'll find okay. Professor okay. Mike's course being advertised now. Okay. And we'll put out those details at the bottom of our screens uh, as well. And of course, uh, a wink. Uh, 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 is is uh, the portal uh, that uh, Professor Michael is working on? Okay, uh, you know I'm just going to uh, change the gear now and uh, yeah. and rope in uh, Professor Kirby. Professor Kirby, you know uh, this is something that we've already experienced. It's already happened, even though now schools and uh, are sort of reopening uh, around around the world. We're seeing them reopen now, even where we are sitting here in India. They're they're open for a bit uh, in the UK, but then you know uh, uh, things for the past few weeks have been a bit difficult there. Uh, but I'm assuming, ma'am, that uh, just like uh, we will get back to our offices, but a little bit of work from home will remain. In dealing with homeschooling, what are the lessons that have been learned, ma'am? And right now, what are the challenges that still remain? Well, I think the, the key lesson is that um, most parents aren't teachers. So I think that's a primary one to start with, that, you know, suddenly flipping home and you're trying to balance your work life and teach your children is not easy and for some people uh, some families have poor digital literacy so they haven't got good computer skills they may not have good computer access they may not so you might be sharing a computer between your family so that causes challenges so the first thing is are we ready for this were we ready no we weren't did everybody have the skills to be able to engage no they didn't and actually for teachers a creating teaching environment for, for parents and for the children has been a real challenge. And I think for some families, it's been particularly difficult. Some children are what we call neurodiverse. And this term is where we see some children have learning challenges and the way they attend and communicate and understand. We associate that with things like dyslexia and ADHD and autism. And for some children, this has been impossibly difficult. But for some families, actually having their child having a quiet place to work, working when they want to, walking around at home and learning has been really good. But for some children, it's been really challenging. So I think working from home is not easy. And if you've got children of different ages, uh, having different demands, 
sometimes it's I've heard it's like you know a war separating I have a son who's got a six-year-old and a two-year-old I think one day he said do you think I could set up my office in my car so I think there was a, a feeling of you know, impossibility of trying to work and support children at home as well but what we've learned is some children can work very well we need to make sure there's connectivity and the skills to teach how we show the information to children, how they engage, and we can't assume it's right for all children. And hopefully, as we move back into school, children need other children. It's about social interaction. Okay, uh, there are two things uh, that we were discussing last time also, and I just pick your brain and before, before we move on. Uh, one is a lot of kids who are looking forward to going back to meeting friends and, and, and catching up. Uh, but uh, we've also noticed that there are now some children who are actually very reticent because there's a little bit of phobia about meeting other people. Uh, and especially if you're already shy uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a classroom setting or in a school setting, uh, how do we deal with that challenge going? So the first thing is, is to give children information, what's going to happen. A fear is often there because you don't quite know what to expect. And we've been telling children for months that they mustn't go near other children and they must separate and they and, and we pulled them out of school. So information for the parents that they feel confident that they can say what will happen when they go to school is important to reinforce that. So information beforehand, clarity when they get there that this is safe and, and to say what the parameters are safe because you know we used to say go and play out in the playground, climb on the climbing frames, you can give your children your friends a hug. If the rules have changed, it is about clarity about that. And actually, we know from the evidence that the risk to children of getting COVID is particularly low, mm. and especially young children. Well, and we need to see that actually the mental well-being of children is important. So allowing children to play and encouraging them to do so and saying this is OK is yeah, going to be important. Moving I, mean, forward. I mean, fingers crossed. So far, uh, you know, the risk to children has been low. Uh, but uh, throughout this period, they've been discussing that the children might have a low risk, but uh, them bringing a disease home uh, but that was in a period when we did not have or were still speculating about a vaccine i think uh, i think a, a quarter of the yeah. uk population has already been vaccinated we are now uh, in india about 8 million doses done uh, in america i think 10 percent of the population is done so there is a clear end goal here that is coming you know they are, why don't you pick this up from here because yeah. uh, uh, there is some kind of social interaction that can happen through these uh, uh, you know calls and, and speaking to my friends uh, during the middle <laughs> of the lockdown uh, through Zoom uh, was cathartic. Uh, I think that got us through it uh, because at least you could, you know, uh, sit down together and have a conversation. But there is some form of social interaction that can't obviously happen. You can't do a certain amount of things. Uh, so why don't, you, why don't you pick it up from here? Yes, as you are rightly mentioning here, Rishabh, there are certain still risk attached uh, how, to how we behave. So we have to be mindful of that, of course. Uh, and like Professor Mando was saying, you know, be uh, have a routine, have a kind of, you know, be aware what's going to happen. Keep yourself updated, what you can do, what you can't do. And especially for children, it's very important you set routines for them because they function well with the structure in place. And even adults, you know, just because, you know, we are not going to a workplace now or we are we are not commuting we don't have a structure and that can be very mentally upsetting sometimes so that is why i would completely agree with what uh, amanda was saying previously that it's important to have those structures being mindful of you know what are things that we we can still do without going out or socializing in big groups we still can have some form of interaction and just uh Rishabh, i would also pick uh, uh, amanda's brain on as she was speaking speaking about the neurodivergent population you know we often talk about children but we miss out this segment because for people who are uh, having these challenges uh, let's say for autism or ADHD any kind of change is very difficult so one time you ask them to play next time you ask them not to go to school and socialize it can be very difficult not only for them but for their caregivers who are with them 24 seven. So Professor Amanda, if you could just throw some light on how parents can actually manage those children, you know, who struggle with any form of changes. Sure, so I think I go back to what you've just said, which I think is a really important point, which is routine and structure. So if, and it goes back to what Michael was saying about sleep. So it might be during this time, bedtimes have been a little bit later, getting up is a little bit later, there isn't the structure. The one thing when you go back to school is that you need to be prepared. 
So you need to have your bag packed. You need to be ready for school. So that starts the night before. So if you've got children, you need to be starting to say, let's get, if they're wearing, get their clothes out the night before, make sure there's a good bedtime routine so that child is getting used to, this is when you go to bed and there's a, there's good, what we call sleep hygiene, which I'm sure Mike will pick, Mike will pick up on. So then when they get up in the morning, they have breakfast. That's really important that they have something to eat before they go. And they also, you can use visual timetables at home. So the child knows what to expect, especially if we're going back to this new normal. To, uh, it, the timetable might have changed. The school day might look different. So giving that information to the child visually, and if they're younger, it could be photos or pictures or words and going through it with them will reassure them the night before they know what's going to happen. So talk mm. through it, okay? So when they go to school, just work your way through the day and just think about, do they have they got their pencil case? Have they got the kit they require? Uh, so the child is prepared for any of the lessons they're going to do. And when they come home is to, to go through that again. How was your day? What worked, what didn't? Do you need some extra support? And good liaison with school always helps. So what's happening at home to know what's happening at school and the two between is really useful because if a child's had a bad night and they're not focusing very well in school uh, during the day, it's really useful to know. So structure, tell it in a way that is uh, accessible to the child, depending on that child's age mm -hmm. and preparation, really those things will help. And if the school is saying the child needs to wash their hands when they arrive, mm -hmm. that information, so the child isn't, worried and doesn't know what's going to happen that can make a big difference to children who have ADHD or ASD or any child okay uh, uh, Michael why don't, you, why don't you come in on this uh, sleep hygiene uh, uh, I never wanted to wake up in the morning for school uh, and I never wanted to sleep uh, when I came back uh, so sleep hygiene how do we get back into that cycle especially for for young children going back to school Yes, uh, fortunately for young children, I mean, when it comes to sleep and, and uh, just as Amanda said, uh, a phrase that I often say is that sleep loves structure. And uh, so it's really important and we've lost that structure. Mm -hmm. So we have to bring that back. And if you find that your child has been going to bed later and been waking up later, then like Amanda said, you need to prepare for that. And you don't necessarily prepare for that the night before when it comes to sleep because the body clock that we have can only shift about sort of 15 to 30 minutes per day. So for instance, if you've noticed if your child's been going to bed a bit later, like an hour later or um, even half an hour later, then say for instance, for a young child, you'd like them to go to bed 15 minutes earlier each night. So if you can do that, say a few nights before going back to school, then you might get them to go to a time to bed that's a lot better. So that's a really crucial thing. And having that nice wind down time, dimming the lights, dimming the activity as well. Um, try to see if they can uh, read. That's one of the best sort of techniques. Listening to music is also quite calming as well. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, we've done some research looking at different technological devices. And uh, believe it or not, one device that we've been using for decades, the television, we've actually found that there's actually not really a relationship between watching the television and sleep although there are relationships with video gaming and using a mobile phone. So uh, the TV can actually be a way to sort of wind down at the end of the day, but possibly not right up until bedtime. Watch some TV, do some reading, listen to music and have a nice relaxing sleep. Okay, I have, I have a partner who's so used to me watching television that now when it's not on, she says she can't sleep <laughs> in the background. But, you know, since you mentioned that uh, there is a, a related question uh, that has come yes. in through the Psyconnect social media handles. This is Kunju Jawar, uh, uh, head of facilities at Apex Hospital. And uh, and uh, Professor Michael, let me take this with you. Uh, uh, who's asking, uh, you know, we've been asked to stay out of gadgets for a long time. But with uh, the lockdown and COVID, that was the normal thing to do. Uh, I've been told that taking your phone to bed and being on your phone uh, while in bed is not good uh, in terms of falling asleep. Uh, so gadget addiction uh, we're all working on gadgets how important does it become uh, my, my professor michael and and how does that affect our habits especially uh, when it goes to sleep as you're mentioning what works what doesn't yes so um we did a study where we asked teenagers to stop using their mobile phone one hour earlier than usual but they were allowed to go to any other type of device so they could go to an ipad they could go to a music player a tv 
And what we found is that the teenagers were able to fall asleep earlier and they were able to get about, say, 20 minutes of extra sleep that night. So if you're talking about, uh, you know, a school week, which is five nights, then they were getting about 100 minutes extra sleep. So really, when it does come to the mobile phone, the one thing that we're noticing is that a lot of people talk about the blue light and the bright light that comes from the phone. You can simply just, you know, turn that down and have a dim screen. But when we've tried to do studies and shine a bright iPad in people's faces in the hour before bed, we actually noticed that it didn't affect their time taken to fall asleep. What it does do is that people don't feel sleepy, so they just keep going. They're not aware of the time. So the crucial part to this is that you can actually be on devices. You will start to habituate to it. You can start to adapt to it, but you have to be very aware of what you're doing. You have to be very aware of the time. If you go to bed at the usual sort of time, you shouldn't have too much trouble falling asleep. So the technological devices aren't as harmful as we originally thought, okay. but if you allow them to sort of consume you and get involved in, I guess, what some of the companies um, have done. If uh, people have uh, seen The Social Dilemma, for instance, that's a documentary looking at how Facebook and YouTube, they try to con get us to continue watching or using their service. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I that think, is the problem. I think the world, one thing I find that affects me the most is the infinite scroll. It never ends. And he's just constantly tempted to carry on, carry on, carry on, and then you realize time has passed by. But uh, 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 Professor Kirby, why don't you take that uh, same thought, ma'am? Uh, gadget addiction... Uh, uh, we are obviously spending much more, more time on gadgets and obviously spending much more time on our mobile phones. Uh, I'm on, you know, we are, I'm on two gadgets simultaneously. I have my phone in front of me and laptop in front of me. Uh, they are required. They are essential tools now. But what is addiction to the point that it becomes harmful? So I think it's, it's sometimes it's what you're doing and how much you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And so what, what is, is an addictive behavior when you don't, you can't stop. So there isn't a break in the day. So constantly checking emails, that you're not that you're not sitting and relaxing and focusing on one thing, that you're watching television and you're checking your emails at the same time. And we've seen this from working from home that the edges of work have blurred. Mm. So there isn't a nice start time and finish time. So it's actually it's what you're doing with your screen time, uh, which is like like getting getting and checking your emails and just I'll do it tonight. Um, I'll just do a bit more work tonight, so I'll have less to do in the morning. So the edges get blurred, so you don't have time to relax and to have time off your work, your workload. So that's really important. So an addiction to screen time is when you can't stop doing that. You can't put your mobile phone down. You can't put it away. And you are constantly checking. And that's what causes your cortisol levels to go up. Your stress levels are going up. Because you're and you're you're reacting to that. I, I so can, it's actually we need to get into better habits in that okay, sense. I can, even I can for probably our children as well. I probably need to sign up for that uh, that that's a sleep course. Uh, uh, there's another question coming our way, but before that, you know, uh, uh, I'm just going to throw this in there and, and Professor, uh, Professor Michael help us understand this. Uh, binge watching uh, that is one thing for sure that affected sleep cycles during the lockdown. Trying to finish a series overnight or not being able to turn it off. Uh, how how bad is that? Uh, uh, is it is it okay once in a while, or 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 is it something to be wary about? Yeah, I think uh, the key thing here is what is the consequence. If you are binge watching and then you are falling asleep later, then you are going to wake up later. Now, for a lot of people, that's quite fine because they're not having to get up uh, by an alarm and travel to work. But when we do go back to work, that's when we will start to notice that sort of thing. Um, and again, it goes back to if people haven't seen The Social Dilemma, I totally recommend you watch that. It's um, we, we learned about this interaction between the individual and the developer of technology. Uh, a couple of years ago, when we had teenagers coming into our sleep laboratory and we got them to play a game. And what we noticed is that the developers are now using psychology to be able to get people to be able to continue using their devices, their games. Etc. So I think people have to be quite aware, and certainly watch that show, The Social Dilemma. Don't watch it too late at night. No, but no, absolutely right. Just just <laughs> when if you're playing a game or something that just when you're when you're just your your attention is wandering, you get an award or you get you know some extra coins. 
uh, and you go oh, hey and then you back right so that happens okay so let me pick up another question and be a while yeah. to take this Rich- one yeah yeah go yeah. ahead Rich- yeah richard just before that i just wanted to add as uh, michael and uh, amanda were saying you know and how in- important it's also for teenagers because they're constantly on facebook and instagram using filters it kind of impacts also their well being when they're constantly engaging in this kind of behaviors where they're uploading pictures waiting for that like waiting for that comment and when they don't get it it takes a toll on them so easily yeah. so yeah. it's also very uh, important for as as parents or adults to understand you know uh, whether we are putting some boundaries or whether some some limits on the screen use both in terms of the time they use and the content they're watching or using also if i could just uh, point out on the blue light studies you know i mean professor mike uh, would be a better person but we know the blue lights that is emitted from the device it kind of puts our brain always into this uh, mode where the brain thinks it's daylight and that's why we are not able to f- uh, fall asleep we are always going into that jet lag mode and that keeps us sleep deprived so it starts with one day goes on to the next day and for months and days finally you know it impacts your well being so we are always thinking about okay we are feeling exhausted and tired but we don't necessarily think of the mental uh, you know the the significant impacts it has on our uh, mental well being so tiredness or you without a doubt you have a bad night sleep and you are definitely more irritable if it happens all the time well uh, you can imagine uh, what that does on even interpersonal relationships okay but there's yes. a very practical question uh, coming up this is uh, uh, vani behani she's a student uh, and she's writing in and she wants to know the why did you take this one what are mental health organizations uh, or helplines that are available in india i know there are quite a, quite a few uh, and yeah. of course i connect now is one of them uh, can you take that that one for us dear yes thank you vani for the question and just to start with we have some returns mumbai we have sneha foundation and jeevan asha helpline for suicide prevention uh, there's all india kiran helpline by government of mental health rehabilitation and fortis also has a helpline which is 24/7 available for anyone willing to seek a professional help but of course we also have a group of experts as we are discussing today and they are well equipped and very much trained in supporting anybody who require emotional and mental health support so pick up your phone talk to us drop us a line or con- or you know our contact details and numbers are available on all our websites or you can even dm us through our any of our social media platforms so there are quite a few and i am i'm i'm happy to say that uh, the mental health organizations in india have also increased since this covid has happened and and don't be shy uh, reach out it's okay to ask for help uh, and uh, i can i can tell you know while you know while i've not been telling people uh, to uh, call up a professional but the one thing i've said is make sure you speaking to people every day uh, call up friends you not spoken to in years Uh, and catch up it just having a conversation help reaching out to people helps and if a, if a professional knows what uh, uh, he or she is doing even better okay uh, you know uh, we were talking about mental well being and let me get in uh, professor kirby into this um, uh, ma'am specifically for health care professionals uh, whom you can well imagine i remember during the first phases uh, you there's a lockdown on so you can't even do shopping Uh, so you have no food to eat yet you have to be there for 12 14 hours you worried about your own safety then you're worried about your fa- family's safety uh and and your normal routine can't get done also because it was you know you can't even call up someone and help you buy your groceries it had become that bad it's not that bad now but uh, what do we do about the well-being of of especially healthcare workers professor kirby i think the first thing is is that each person has their own feelings and not to think that somebody suffered more than me there isn't a hierarchy of suffering so if you are not focusing not being able to cope as you said reach out and ask for help that's number 1 number 2 is focus on what you can control so in this in this really difficult time sometimes we catastrophize we go what happens if and what happens next really important to say okay what have i got in my control what can i do and sometimes that's taking 5 minutes of time for yourself and i think that's really important because a lot of healthcare workers have had enormous stress and exposed to really difficult times so actually being able to say okay what can i do for myself it's a bit like the airline you know take off the mask and put it on yourself before you help others and actually realizing being kind to yourself is an essential part of this and i think people who are empathic and healthcare workers often 
tend and befriend other people before actually tending and befriending themselves. So I would first of all say it's really important to see this is essential to your well-being so you can help others. What, and about, to, what about family members, ma'am? Uh, family members of healthcare professionals. So uh, family members of healthcare. The fear and the psychosis that they've been going through. Yeah, so I think the first thing is, is again, focus on what you can actually do. So if you're a healthcare worker, when you come home, make sure that you you wash, you wash your hands, you you um, anti-back the areas that are around. You you respect the vac the virus, you know, to reduce the risk mm -hmm. in the way that we've been told to do. But there is a limit to what those contact. There is a limit. So focus on what you actually can do. Reassure okay. your 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 family that you are protecting them, but you need to mentally be able to look after yourself. I think that's okay. very important. Okay, is is so, there is there a systemic structure that can be provided? I mean, if you are already a healthcare worker and you're going, okay, I have I have immense responsibility. I don't have the time to. Uh, uh, be be treating myself and if I'm facing anxiety then there's nothing I can do about it right now uh, is should there be a systemic structure I mean uh, should uh, should there be a system of, of reporting because sometimes uh, if you report on a colleague that's seen as as invasive uh, of their private space how do we how do we create this in a in a structured approach ma'am rather than just a personal one well I think in a structured approach that if you're working you're in the workplace and you're worried about your colleagues is we have a responsibility to ask them if they're coping, but also to talk to line managers, peers that we're working to ask for help. So that is very important. Other people's health care needs are important. That's not about encroaching in somebody's space. You're worried about that individual. I think having an opportunity to talk is really important and share experiences. And I think people would have been through difficult times and some of them will be grieving. I think we need to recognize that grief comes in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And some of us will have had losses in our lives. People have been unwell, who are sick, who have died. And we need to recognize that we may all be in different parts of that cycle. And some of that can present with anger. So I think we've got to be kind to each other, that if somebody is irritable, to recognize that might be that they're grieving. That mm -hmm. if they're quieter and not communicating, they may be struggling. So being aware that we are, we might present in that in different ways and be kind and talk and ask and show that where the help is available. Signposting, like we were talking about the organizations in India that are available in Southeast Asia, is to signpost within your organization and to local organizations. Hmm. And to have those conversations is to say we are all can be vulnerable. I think that's okay. the thing, is have those conversations. Okay, let, let's pick up another, another important segment of, of of our population and of course of our lives uh, and our families we touched upon this uh, in in our last uh, uh, webinar also but uh, uh, on elderly people and you know there are various aspects to this so why don't i take uh, professor michael's help first on this uh, people professor michael who are suffering from ailments uh, sometimes physical ailments that through pain or otherwise impact sleep and then that of course that leads to cascading issues beyond that uh, in an elderly population what is possible what's not well the good news is that uh, you know when it comes to the contributing factors for causing insomnia whether it's from infancy through to um, older adults uh, the same principles apply so the same treatments apply as well um, so therefore, the cognitive behavior therapy has been around for many decades. And this is actually the technique that works uh, for a lot of adults. Now, that's uh, still to recognize that older adults do have extra complications compared to younger adults. Like you mentioned, they can have comorbid medical conditions. They can be on multiple medications and so forth. And like you mentioned as well, you can have sleep problems, for example, pain, and pain will wake you up during the night. Uh, and, but that's important because you need to move during the night. You can't stay in the same place. Um, and then it's when it's getting a bit too bad and you're starting to get a lot of insomnia that that can then feed into the pain and it becomes what we call a vicious cycle and it actually builds upon itself. But something like cognitive behaviour therapy really looks at certain behaviours that we do before bedtime, during the night if we wake up, and what we do in the morning, and tries to modify those so we can make the most of our physiology, I should say our sleep physiology, which helps us to sleep quicker and stay asleep during the night. And then the, the cognitive component looks at our thought processes, like what Amanda was talking about in terms of catastrophizing. We don't necessarily 
go to bed to start thinking and planning, but a lot of us do. And that's a natural thing. People have to understand it's not them. It's a very common thing that happens. As soon as you don't have the distractions during the day, it's very easy to have those thoughts coming into your head and, and into your mind. But something like cognitive therapy will get you to really start to recognize that that might be happening for you and refocus your thoughts elsewhere and try to have a bit more balance. And, and also there's other techniques you can do during the day to really sort of challenge that thinking and realize like we mentioned about school kids being a bit anxious about going to school that's a prediction but you don't know if that's necessarily going to happen and really reflect on times when you've worried about something and it didn't come true and realize that this might not come true as well so okay. it's really that sort of combination there but at least we have a therapy that can work for older adults okay uh, you know professor just just on that theme you know talking about about older older, older adults as you as you mentioned uh the traumatic experience of the past year, which is uh, even greater disconnect from, from family, uh, absolutely no visitation. I mean, for example, uh, my parents, I am yet to yet to physically meet them. I've you know waved at them from a balcony, but, uh, but that's about it. And it's been a year. Uh, and uh, they're apparently not going out of the house at all. Uh, I still am. I still at least have to go to work. And you know, there is some, some change of routine of getting into a car and seeing people around you and going into a workplace. Uh, obviously, that's going to have left some impact. Uh, uh, how do we understand what that impact is? So when things do normalize a little bit, uh, we'll have to accept that uh, older adults coming back are, are going to be facing some kind of trauma. What do you suspect that will be and how do we deal with it? Well, I think, I think there's probably a, a good uh, silver lining to this, really. And, you know, I think a lot of people are going to respect a bit more to spend more time with their family members. You know, I think in the past, it was a case that people might sort of say, oh, yeah, I'll catch up with them next week. I don't think they're going to be thinking that anymore. I think that it's, it's more of a case that, no, I better go out now and catch up with my family. I better pick up the phone and, and talk to them. Uh, there'll be more of a yearning for it. In terms of the trauma, I think uh, that can hopefully be washed away with more of these sorts of experience. And we were taken aback by this uh, pandemic. We we didn't think this was going to happen. We had heard of, you know, bird flu and SARS and so forth coming out of uh, Asia. And we've dealt with that before. We re really didn't expect this sort of impact. But I think now we're going to be prepared for any sort of future waves and uh, make the most of it when we can actually physically make contact with family members. Okay, so we are, we are better prepared and it might, might happen. it might happen again. So now we know that uh, we don't know when this is going to happen again. Hopefully it doesn't happen in another century. Adhya, you wanted to make a point. Go ahead. Yeah, so since we are talking about the trauma and the mental scars, I wanted to put this question out to Amanda or Mike and uh, help our viewers understand how do we build resilience? Yes, it's easy to say that, you know, we have experienced uh, the worst of the pandemic in our lifetimes, but maybe we are yet to come out of that. So how do we build resilience among our frontline workers or our children or some some uh, elderly member who have almost lost their partner or, you know, they're severely gone through this uh, particular infection? So how do we build resilience so that, you know, they can bounce back with full energy? Yeah, Professor Kirby, you want to take that first? So I, th I think one of the things is uh, resilience is built with connections. It goes back to what Michael's saying. And that's one of the things that, we're human, we want to connect with those we care for and those that, are, that we love. So we can build resilience by ensuring those connect connections happen so that children make friends and they, they, are they, then we work in the community and we grow community connections as well, as well as school connections. Finding value in what you do is really important as well. So being valued and finding others valued. So, and so doing things that make you feel happy is really important. So seeking the strengths and being able to build upon those is going to be important. Rather than looking at the, all our challenges to say, okay, what have we learned from this? And what we know from lots of parents and from the children during this time is we've had some gains. So um, my husband's learned to bake bread. He'd never baked a, a loaf of bread before in his life before lockdown. Um, you connected with people perhaps across the world on Zoom that you might not have talked to for 20 years, yeah? You might have learned about your child and to see that actually at home, you can see things they've helped you out at home where they wouldn't have helped you out before. So yeah. I think one of the things around resilience is, is learning from our gains. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Maintaining and building those connections and then really building on the things that work for you. So understanding yourself. And maybe that's one of the things we've learned about ourselves is actually we are quite resilient. And I think for elderly folk, 
they will want to connect. I'm a grandparent. I want to connect and see my children. So as soon as I can, I'm going to be out there. I've got to just, might be, just have to not give hugs to start with. Mm. But I think the, the lure of humanity will mean we will want to reconnect. True that. Michael, you want to take that? Yeah, I think I might uh, uh, focus uh, or at least sort of try to teach the uh, audience that there's different types of sleep that we experience through the night. We go from light sleep to deep sleep, but we also go up to a light stage of sleep called REM sleep, and that's where we dream. Uh, so a lot of people are aware of that. But what we're learning in terms of the research is that REM sleep is very important for regulating our emotions. And in fact, if you're getting a good night's sleep, and especially REM sleep, that helps you to cope with the traumas that you've had the, the previous day. But the other fascinating thing is if you get good sleep and you get good REM sleep, that prepares you for a trauma as well. So it's really been seen as overnight therapy. So we can do all of these different sorts of tactics and uh, techniques that can help build resilience uh, during the day. But we really have to be mindful about trying to also get a good night's sleep and just to also look at some of our behaviors because alcohol suppresses REM sleep. So if you're noticing if you have consumed more alcohol during this pandemic, you want to gradually start to possibly come back on that so you can get good REM sleep and that can help you cope with the emotional day to day uh, stresses that we have. OK. All right. Uh, we have, uh, another audience question coming in and. Uh... Uh, Dia, could you uh, help us uh, take this one? Uh, this is Abhishek Pandey. He is uh, doing his MBA. He's he's asking how many private label organizations uh, we are talking about. You know, which have you know a few employees are there in India to assist mental healthcare service structures in India, and what can we do to get the government to measure the the issues related to this? Uh, Dia, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. I think I have to start by saying that there are handful and the government is realizing the need uh, for greater levels of engagement and support. And that's where organizations like us come in, you know, with our experts, their courses, their trainings, and of course, our ARC charter, where we try to create the greater engagement through awareness to our recognition projects or our knowledge projects on mental health, like uh, like Professor Mike was saying earlier, you know, he's coming with the CBT course to train people on their sleep cycles and habits. Professor Kirby has been very generous to, you know, partner with us and, you know, uh, have, uh, uh, you know, do it solutions uh, products, which start from the spiky profiles, neurodiversity courses, employee well-being. All this uh, is available even in India today uh, through our platform. So what? But the point I'm trying to make here, Richard, is uh, you know, it's it's is to say that it's time to give mental health sector its due respect. It's time to recognize that mental health professionals and practitioners who are putting in the hard yards. Um, it's it's time to empower them. It's time to recognize the work they do. So we need to bring and 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 I always say this, and I've mentioned earlier also, but I will again emphasize and say that you know uh, not only just government, even social enterprises or private organizations like us need to take our own initiative, play our own ownership. You know, investing on mental health or investing on employee well-being, and that is the way you know we can bring mental health outside the context of charity, because in India, it's still considered a charity service, but not a professional service. And Good. that is how we are going to give the mental health professionals so, yeah, and how, this how mental health sector about, respect. Know, because, you know, last time, you know, you were telling me about your specialization, which is, you know, yeah. through, through visual, right, art yeah, uh, and visual therapy, right? Uh, and uh, of course, a uh, 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 professor uh, Gradisar has been telling about his his specializations. How are you going about, you know, collecting people of, of various specializations? You know, is this going to be eventually a digital only thing, or is it going to be something beyond that? It's definitely going to be beyond that because we want to be that mental health university. I don't recall any university in India which only talks and you know teaches and trains on mental health. We want to be one of those or one of its kind, you know, uh, training people on understanding mental well-being, mental health, and the different kind of dysfunctions related to our mental health. So. Just going back to a question specifically, Rishabh, you know, I specialize in art. So I, as a psychologist, started doing art therapy. And then I realized that it's just a tiny fraction in psychology or mental health. And I alone can only do so much. That's why I collaborated with like, experts and professionals worldwide, like Professor Amanda, you know, uh, Professor Michael, because they bring their expertise. And it's also important to mention here, Rishabh, that uh, 
in our country we are still very much focused for our mental health and well being on medicines or medical approaches than non medical approaches and these experts bring that to us bring that services available to us and and at a very democratic price point so that's where you know i keep on stressing the genesis of psychonect is if you want to look after your mental well being you can do it without medicines there are treatments that are equally effective and perhaps more safe uh you know uh, if you don't want to have medicines for uh, for your mental well being so yes uh, risha that we have started with the arc charter which is awareness recognition and knowledge on mental health we have let's say we've reached out to grassroots level through our art projects like our t-shirts or merchandising uh, writing simple lines to make them aware that mental health is equally important like physical health we talk to separate you know groups uh, uh explaining them you know how even dressing up you know looking after yourself like professor amanda was saying self compassion or is is going to have a positive impact on your well being so these are the awareness projects we are doing then we have the knowledge uh, project which again is by you know these experts who bring their courses their trainings to equip our our mental health professionals here with the right skill sets and finally the knowledge that means when you have the right knowledge you will be able to deliver those services not only in india but worldwide you will be mental health champions and that's what we endeavor to do in our mental health platform psychonect well uh, i am grateful that i have had the opportunity to listen in uh, and uh, be part of this uh, if this conversation uh, tv anchors end up to be end up being the biggest generalists of them all but i can tell you for the first time in my life Uh, i'm used to stress i'm used to all sorts of odd hours and all sorts of pressures uh, yesterday night i was just got back home and you know suddenly there was an, an earthquake here and then you know everything was uh, but anxiety uh we've still had to have people reporting on the field right uh, and uh, then i have to make the call whether it's safe for you to go or not how do i make that call uh impossible it's been absolutely impossible i felt anxiety for the first time Uh, in my life so i am very truly say that once upon a time you know when we were much younger uh, you know you need to see a shrink used to be a joke or an insult uh, that has gone away now uh, we have a mental professional very regularly sitting with us uh, in fact just yesterday a couple of days ago uh, we had people I was tell- telling them that this telecast of that we'll be doing uh, uh, and that uh, that has changed completely and I'm, and that's a change definitely for 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 the better i'm going to thank you uh, Uh, for uh, dia uh, and your team at psychonet for putting this conversation together for us uh, it's a truly an intercontinental one uh, a wink and the bed uh, behind professor michael uh, <clears throat> looks very very comfortable and i'm sure to guarantee you some rem sleep and if nothing else uh, that uh, we've realized that if uh, if a if a colleague of mine says that they're late to work because they've slept in i'm going to be a lot more understanding uh, of that that's probably good for them thank you so much for having this uh, conversation we managed to discuss uh children going back to school uh what's changed what's not uh, older adults and specifically hopefully we put out the importance of reaching out reaching out it's it's not a crime it's nothing embarrassing and in fact it can be something cathartic just having a conversation uh just reaching out to someone does not mean you're being weak that does not mean you're not being able to deal with your problems yourself you are but there are all of us going through the same kinds of problems and uh, somebody who knows a little bit more about it what can what can the harm possibly be uh, everything as dia said is not a pill you take thank you uh, professor michael uh, professor amanda and of course uh, dia and the team at psychonnect uh, and thank you very much for watching this uh, telecast and uh, please do share it with as many people as you can uh, so that uh, we can get the message out there uh, this is important in our country uh, and across the world but uh, in a place where this was not being taken seriously up until a year ago I'm glad that we now are. Thanks very much for watching. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.